poison thing. Let's take a look at this um, Fadak issue. I want to explain that. It's... Right, so... On momento, on momento, people. Right, so I've explained previously that, uh, that, which was quite brief, but I've been asked to go over it. I have looked into this in much more detail now. Um, gone through, you know, the entire hadith involved, a lot of the history. I also had the opportunity to go down to, within Birmingham, that this uh, just weekend gone, really, just Saturday, there was a, uh, a kind of symposium held on this at a Shia institute, which was looking at the Fadak issue from a Shia and Sunni perspective and just highlighting the case at hand. Obviously, I mean, the, the institute was Shia, but it's it was kind of with regard to the Sunni perspective as well. And the institute was called uh, Al-Mahdi Institute. It's in Selly Oak in Birmingham. I have to say, first of all, just as a side note, for one, I was so mesmerized by the actual building and institute that they've got. Honestly, I've I I totally loved it. It's I, I think it was part of Birmingham University or something before. It's like a university hall or a separate kind of um, a unit almost, which uh, has all its en suites and everything, and very modern, amazing kind of landscape. Just I I, I was wowed, mesmerized by it as a Islamic faculty. I mean, I've been in faculties like that before that, or when I'm going to things like psychology courses at universities and stuff like this but I've never seen anything to do with Muslims like that and it was incredibly organized up to date you know kind of technology um, I, I was just wowed one with the building two there's uh, I think it's under the um, I think the principal sheikh there is Sheikh Arif a very kind of balanced uh, Shia scholar uh, it was the first time I met him but somebody who's he's quite very controversial within the Shia circles. He's challenged a lot of controversial Shia points, and I think the, a lot of the Shia have actually boycotted him. Uh, but uh, amazing, very hospitable person. I love the the way they welcomed me. There were many Sunnis there, by the way. Some great uh, traditional Sunni scholars, like uh, like trained in uh, back home, Pakistan, etc. People like Allama Khalid Mahmud Saab. Um, amazing, and I was overwhelmed with the amount of love he was showing me because I was thinking, come on, I mean, I, I, because I, I really did not expect it from somebody uh, so traditional uh, looking at me. I mean, because you know, I mean, just the way I look and things like this, and my views are sometimes very kind of challenging. But so hospitable he was, uh, Allama Khalid Saab and Mufti Farooq Saab. Both these are Sunni kind of scholars from Birmingham, um, old school. And they presented their things in Urdu. But it was an amazing opportunity. So I thought I'll just mention that there. I did really enjoy the visit there. And um, I think we need to collaborate so much more. You know, Sunni, Shia, this whole thing. We need to really... Um, we really need to kind of um, go through this. V Vera, you are busy, but if you get a bit of time, please do answer my question. Oh, yes. Uh, Sid, shukran, much love. I definitely will. I'm just trying to see <laughs> what the question was. Right. I've got to... If you can just repost your question, please. And it doesn't need to be... It could just be a standard post. I... I will get to it. I'm just, as soon as, uh, let me just go through Fadak. I can't see the question. Right, so. Right, so. I can't see. Uh, Mesut, I can't see his question. Can somebody post his question, please? Um, right, so. I wanted to discuss, so we went through this whole thing a bit about Fadak. So Fadak is to do with it's a piece of land i'm going to bring it up let me just see here so for people asking this as you can see uh i've got it highlighted there fadak and in the center in the kind of rectangle is uh 
uh, is Medina. So you can see that there. Right, so that's Fadak. And to the top, uh, left of it is Khaybar and it was in the outskirts of Khaybar Fadak was and it was um, kind of given to the Prophet uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as part of fate okay now fate is that land which the it's that land which the Prophet is given Uh, it's that that land which the prophet receives through without warfare so it's a kind of truce but as part of the truce people sometimes they would say things like especially in in, in old times they would say things like look if you um, uh, they would they would say things like look okay we don't want war I'll tell you what we'll do this sometimes they might say look i'll tell you what we'll all leave this region we'll move to that region you can have this or they might say something like you know what just take this particular thing and let's have a truce let's do this that whatever it was, it was a kind of compromise that people would do so during the battle of khaybar there were a lot of surrounding territories and and some of them were taken as a truce they weren't actually taken as um, uh, as you know with actual war and there is the verse of the quran we're looking at is in surah al-hashar so if we take a look at it begins with verse 5 ma qata'tum so a'udhu billahi min shaitan rajeem so allah says uh, ما قطعتم من لينة أو تركتموها قائمة على أصولها فبإذن الله وليخزي الفاسقين. So Allah is speaking about them this as you go into warfare and so on. وما أفاء الله على رسوله and that which Allah gives as fate and fate is this land or whatever comes as a truce. Um, uh, على رسوله منهم فما أوجفتم عليه من خيل ولا ركاب ولكن الله يسلط رسله على من يشاء. and you have not had to kind of wage your you know war with your horses or do things like this. Allah has given Allah has allowed the messenger to kind of preponderate and subdue and control the situation here. And it mentions Wallahu ala kulli shayin qadir ma afa Allahu ala rasuli. So what Allah gives as fate min ahli al qura falillahi walil rasul. Then it is for Allah and His Rasul. Walidil qurba. So walidil qurba wal yatama wal masakin wa ibn al sabil. Kayla yakuna dulatan bain al agnia in minkum wa ma atakum al rasulu fa khudu. وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُوا وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ شَدِيدُ الْعِقَابِ Now this is uh, from that verse 7 in Surah Al-Hashr. Now in this verse Allah mentions these five categories of, of who, the, who benefits from the faith. For Allah says لِلَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ So people generally count Allah and His Rasul as one. You know, it says wal qurba wal yatama. So the relatives of the messenger, wal yatama, orphans, um, and Allah mentions wabna sabil and people who are uh, travelers that kind of need this and stuff. So the issue is here we're dealing with this land, the, and this particular land that we're looking at is is called Fadak that I've shown in the map. Now. What's happened is during the lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu I want to give you a synopsis in some in more detail that during the lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he had this this land and it was very fertile. They say that Fadak was incredibly fertile. So it had a lot of produce, you know, it produced things like whether it was barley or dates and things like this. Now the Prophet would use it. And in some riwayat, he would use it for travelers that were coming. He would kind of have that allotted and he would have a portion from it. Some riwayat say he would split it in two or sometimes in three and use a portion for this and a portion for that. He would set a certain uh, amount aside as a reserve for crises. Like sometimes there was, you know, low 
food availability. There were things like this. There may have been armies going out. So this is how they were organized. Now, the issue at hand was there's two key issues. After the Prophet's lifetime, could this be inherited by his offspring, who in this case is Fatima radiallahu anha. Now, what we know as a fact is that Fatima radiallahu anha approaches Abu Bakr to ask for uh, inheritance, but she doesn't receive it. She asks for this. Now, she asks for uh, the sadaqat, the sadaqat, as in the, the land which is around Medina, which was Bani Nadir land. She asks for Khaybar and she asks for Fadak. She asks for not just Fadak, quite a, she asks for, there's a, a large claim that is made or a claim for a large quantity is made better to word it better now Abu Bakr radiallahu an responds by saying the prophet said la nurath we as prophets do not bequeath we do not leave things in inheritance ma tarakna sadaqa uh, right so uh, whatever we leave is is a charity um, the question on reincarnation, I'll come to that in just a moment, as soon as I just finish this topic of Fadak. Right, so I will, I will discuss that. I'm just going to, let me just uh, finish this. Right, so the, the issue here is that we know that happened, okay, that she's denied this. Now, the question is, was, who was right here? Right. Khalid uh, Serafi, I'll come to your question as well. Just on momento, on momento. Right, so, uh, and shukran, much love. Right, so, I, I really want to explain this in some detail. So now we have these reports, we have it in Bukhari that uh, Fatima radiallahu anha comes, she asks for this. In fact, I'm going to bring the hadith in front of you. So you can see this hadith here that Fatima is asking Abu Bakr. She asks for the sadaqat of Medina and she asks for um, also Fadak and Khaybar. Now, and then this goes on to mention, it gives a kind of story in Abu Bakr saying, no, that look, I'm just going to leave it as how the Prophet had it. And that the Prophet kind of oversaw thing. He kind of oversaw it, but not as a as his property, but as a guardian, as a manager of it, basically. And it actually belongs to the Muslims. And then it mentions that, and then this went on to Umar, and then Umar kind of allowed the guardianship or the managing of it to Ali and Abbas. And then, uh, but that's of the Bani Nadir land, but Fadak and Khaybar he kept control of under the state and then it mentions that uh, in other narrations it does go on that this in the time of uh, Uthman is then given to Marwan now I want to highlight here there's some important points right and that is it's a really important question this land of Fadak or fate Fate, what we're calling fate, if we're spelling it as F A Y and then with an apostrophe for the Hamza fate. Now, fate, do you, does one own fate or is he simply managing it? Because this is what Allah says that you have obtained without having to struggle for it. So it belongs Lillahi wal Rasul wal Idil Qurba wal Yatama wal Masakini wa Ibn Sabil. Now, does it belong to the general public? Is this an endowment or is this personal property? Here, th there is a difference of opinion amongst scholars on what fate should and ought to be. Now, this really, if one can understand that, they understand the whole debate. Abu Bakr radiallahu an denies Fatima this based on his understanding that this is really not personal property. This belongs to the state, belongs to the general Muslims. So her Fatima radiallahu an her, her perspective was that this belonged to the Prophet himself. Now 
we do the Shia sources seem to indicate they claim that Fatima radiallahu anha during her lifetime was gifted this by the Prophet and she simply came to Abu Bakr to just kind of state her claim and Abu Bakr denied it so this is why some of the Shia then go on to say so this is he usurped he kind of snatched stole her land from her now some of them claim that they go to that extent then the, within the Sunni sources the, like in Abu Dawud there's a hadith that the Prophet in his lifetime Fatima asks her for Fadak and these lands and the Prophet said no he doesn't give it to her now one might say well that doesn't sound like you know is that the case the prophet would have surely given it to her but actually in the sunni sources you do see there's another very famous hadith in which in the sahih uh, in sahih bukhari i believe where the uh, where fatima sees that there's uh, many more servants have been brought in by the state and she comes to the prophet and complains about her struggling with household work and asks for a uh, a slave a servant to kind of help her and the Prophet, when he finds out that this is what she came for, he comes to visit her and he tells her that, shall I tell you something better than that? And that is to recite this dua every day. But he doesn't give her the slave. Now, my point is that it, within the Sunni sources, it appears that during the lifetime of the Prophet, Fatima was not given this, was not gifted this. Uh, although the Shia sources claim it was, so that changes the kind of debate slightly from the two perspectives. We all agree that during Abu Bakr's, uh, after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Fatima comes to Abu Bakr, she asks for it, she isn't given it, uh, she is upset with Abu Bakr. That much is kind of true. And I do think from an inheritance perspective, Fatima radiallahu anha was right, uh, I feel, because looking at it and looking at these arguments from the Quran but this is the thing I kind of now feel both were right in their own way and I want to explain this that Fatima in the sense that in the Quran it mentions that the prophets do inherit like what well, Waritha Suleiman Dawood and Suleiman inherited from Dawood and we know that wasn't prophet, just prophethood we know that the kingdom of David goes on to become the kingdom of Solomon. It becomes one of the most powerful kingdoms in its day and age and one of the most wealthiest kingdom of Solomon. So we know that was wealth. We know that the uh, you've got uh, Zakaria uh, saying, alayhi salam in the Quran, wa inni khiftul mawaliya min khalfi. I, I fear these people after me, that Rabbi Habli, uh, that grant me a child. He says to Allah, yarithuni that may inherit from me wa yarithu min ali yaqub so we know that this inheritance thing does seem to see is, the quran seems to suggest or incline that they do inherit and when allah says to the prophet you seekum allah fi auladikum allah tells you about your children that inheritance is like this and a girl gets this much and a boy allah ought to have then said by the way we don't mean you ya rasulullah we mean normal people rest of the muslims not the prophet but here the prophet is being revealed on to like this verse but yet it doesn't include him and there's no mention of this i do feel that that is a weak argument from that perspective so i do agree with fatima radiallahu anha in that sense about inheritance however after looking into this in a lot of detail i do see that the debate if not about inheritance, if about Fay makes more sense. That Fay belonged, because it was so much wealth, it was something the state needed to, to support the general Muslims, like travelers, times of crises, times like these things can't become personal properties. That the Imam, whatever he gets as an Imam, is not really his personal property. So if today an Imam went out on war, and he got a certain land in truce and that becomes fate then that really is not his personal property to say okay you know what i'm going to give this to my nephew that's not how it, i mean that would upset a lot of muslims because they'd be like no this is muslim general kind of welfare property it's an endowment so i see that angle of a worker as more correct although the line of arguing of mirath seems to not then make a bit of sense that because they're discussing 
inheritance, whereas they should have been really discussing fate. Um, so that's the thing. One thing that definitely gets quite, I think after Fat after Abu Bakr, Umar radiallahu an in Sahih al-Bukhari mentions that he gives the guardianship of it to Ali and Abbas and then they start arguing over it. And what happens, in fact, Bukhari seems to use his words that they insult each other and actually swear at each other. And it mentions the swears as well. Uh, this is Ali and Abbas to each other. And and then it mentions Umar saying to them that, look, I didn't give this to you as your personal you know, property. I gave you to just manage it. Uh, but as by the way, those who manage it do get to benefit from it. They can keep the benefits, but they don't own the actual thing. So... Here it mentions in our riwayat that uh, Ali overcomes Abbas and manages to keep it. Now this is what some of the riwayat mention. Uh, now then in the time of Uthman, and I'm not quite sure, I think here there is a question mark, it becomes hazy because Uthman seems to give it to his cousin Marwan. Uh, I'm not quite sure what was going on there. Maybe Uthman at that time... Uh, felt that you know people don't really need it or whatever or maybe I'm gonna you know I since as I'm the imam I can do so he gives it to Marwan does he give it to him as ownership or does he give it to him as just managing I would think he gives it to him as managing why because otherwise it would have been the inheritance of Marwan's kids but you see Marwan's son after him, Abdul Malik, who becomes the king, the caliph, and then his son, you get Walid and Suleiman, they ought to have inherited it. But in the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz after them, and he's not from Abdul Malik, he's from Abdul Malik's brother, Abdul Aziz. He says, I'm giving this back, I'm returning it to how it was in the time of Abu Bakr and Umar. And he says that this was wrong, you know, I, I disagree, it should be like how it was. So he, he gives it, restores the guardianship back to the family of the Prophet. And then what happens is in the Abbasids time, because they felt that Ali sna snatched it from Abbas, as the Hadith says, they snatch it back. So Mansur snatches it back, then Ma'moon gives it back, then Mutawakkil snatches it back. And it just becomes a kind of a toy, really. But there was something really interesting that needed to be highlighted here. And I mentioned this, by the way, in the symposium I went to, that I said that, look, if this was such a key issue, one thing that you there's a huge kind of a pothole in this argument, and that is during the reign of Ali after Uthman, when he becomes caliph, he never takes it back. And then some of the, the Shia Imams said to me that, look, yeah, but that's because Ali, you know, it's he, he didn't want to because, uh, like they gave me a few answers. One was because, no, land is given to you. You don't demand it. I said, look, come on, that sounds, that doesn't really, mm, you know, that's a weak response because truly speaking, he comes to Umar asking for it, demanding it. So we know he was passionate about it. He even overcomes Abbas on it. So we know he was passionate about it. So the other argument they gave was that uh, Ali radiallahu an at that time for the sake of unity. But that was a weak argument as well because during Ali radiallahu anhu's time, he actually goes to war against several companions of the Prophet, including the wife of the Prophet and other people. So I don't think unity was, it doesn't make any sense. And since Fadak was so fertile, it would have been an excellent resource for his army the kind of supplies and things like this, because he Ali Rodilan spends most of his caliphal rule, uh, you know, the four or five years he has, in civil war. So he would need resources. And the fact that it's so close to Medina and the Umayyads who he was fighting against later on or the Khawarij were up north in Damascus or Iraq, he could have easily taken Fadak. But yet he never even mentions Fadak. He doesn't really, you know, and... So I feel that this is a huge kind of, uh, it's a huge question mark that why did Ali, if this is such a big deal, why did Ali Rodilan not take it in his, in his lifetime as a caliph? And, and, and I feel that none of the Shia responses seem to make sense. So one of the Shia uh, kind of students of knowledge did say to me that this was a metaphor. Fadak, it was never about Fadak, it was a metaphor about the, cali uh, the, the caliphate. So when Fatima radiallahu came to Abu Bakr, she really came saying that he ought to be the imam. 
I found that a bit weak as well because one, it just doesn't really sit right. Two, if she's coming to Abu Bakr, then she's kind of acknowledging that he's the Imam. And I don't know, but so I wanted to really go over this and sum this up that the key issue here, I felt that Fatima radiallahu an, just in the argument of inheritance, I felt that she was kind of right that prophets do inherit. And you can't really use that as an argument. That's my personal uh, understanding. However, from the argument of faith, the land that an imam uh, gains during non uh, combatant kind of war um, that I would feel doesn't doesn't become his personal property it becomes the property of the general public the welfare so I would fall in line with that I so I think that would really be the crux of this issue I did have a little theory as well and I don't mean to uh, this is just coming from you know we were just discussing this and so this this could be completely off but I'll just share it with you I did feel that maybe because Fatima radiallahu anha in her claim asks for so much the quantity is so much maybe that was overwhelming which led to an instant denial because she asks for the sadaqat of Medina, of Bani Nadir, of Khaybar, of Fadak. She asks for it, that, all of that. Maybe, I just thought, I mean, this is just, this is pure spec. This is pure speculation. But I felt maybe because it was so overwhelming and in the time of Abu Bakr, there's the dis social disrest, there's the Musaylam al kathab there's, you know, there's all these things, people, Bani Hanifa saying, we're withdrawing our resources, we're not going to pay anymore, we're not going to give zakat, we're not going to give funds, uh, what do we do, there's an army of Usama already being dispatched, where do they get the resources from, and all of a sudden, Fatima radiallahu anha comes, and she doesn't just ask for a particular, she asks for the Medina resources, she asks for the Khaybar resources, she asks for Fadak, so I felt maybe it was kind of overwhelming quantity, you know, from a quantitative approach. And that's why maybe Abu Bakr radiallahu anh just instantly denied it. Um, and if it hadn't been that much, maybe he wouldn't have denied. I don't, this is pure speculation. I don't mean to, uh, you know, this is with the utmost love for all of these companions. I yeah, absolutely, I do love them. I'm not somebody i disagree in that sense with the the shia approach i do um you know believe and i've got a video that look all the companions i i kind of love them i i do feel that they they were human and that absolutely human it's not that they were kind of angels or anything and and naturally they would have had disagreements and made mistakes but but i just feel that this may be that's what led to that ijtihadi response uh that immediate response because you see the other companions do disagree with Abu Bakr later on but I hope that's of some help uh, I just want to sum that that uh, there is no re you can't resolve these issues but at least you can have some clarity on them guys I hope that's of some help let's move on we've got the masala to get to as well I've been asked right uh, about um Somebody said, just to follow up on that, somebody said, so what he did was wrong. Uh, you see, I believe I'm in line with Abu Bakr radiallahu an. He's thinking in terms of fate. So the argument from fate, I feel Abu Bakr is right. The only problem is in the hadith, it doesn't mention that. It mentions the argument from a point of inheritance. Now inheritance, I feel Fatima radiallahu an was right. So I feel that Fatima was entitled to inheritance, but this land I do personally feel was fate. And, or maybe most of it, if not some of it, maybe wasn't, but most of it was the general Muslim. It belonged to the general state, not to a personal property. It wasn't a... So, but the only kind of confusion is in the Hadith, it doesn't mention fate, it mentions mirath, like the Prophet said, we don't leave inheritance. So, I, so it's all muddled up. So I feel they're kind of both right, but from different perspectives. Um, and then I was just adding the human element of maybe. That was just pure speculation. That's just me thinking, you know, I may be wrong. So, 
you know, and it's not to, by the way, insult anybody. I don't want people to think that, oh my God, he's thinking Abu Bakr wasn't thoughtful or something like this. I do feel that, you know, when we're asked things that, uh, I do feel that Abu Bakr was one of the closest people to the Prophet ﷺ, to the extent that in the Sahih Hadith, when the Prophet is asked by a lady that, look, I need to settle some financial affairs, and and I've got to do this and I'll come back. And the Prophet says, yeah, come back. And she says, فَإِلَّمْ أَجِدْكَ What if I come back and I don't find you? And it says, uh, and بِهِ uh, She intends by what if you're no longer alive by the time I finish these things and come after a few years. And he says, فَأْتِي أَبَا بَكَر Come to Abu Bakr. And I do feel that, you know, he has his uh, an amazing maqam uh, in Islam. رضي الله عنهم جميعا Cool people, let's move on with that. Right, so uh, is it permissible to perform, uh, what? To purchase uh, loans and by turning them into performing ones and foreclosing properties are paid by borrowers? Look, I do feel that the whole, I've got a detailed video on interest and mortgages and I feel that these things, mortgages and whatever are not haram. I've got a very lengthy video explaining it. That said, I'm not quite sure I fully understand this question, Khalid, but if it means kind of doing people over, then I'm against that oppression and things. I don't think it's fair to just kind of exploit people because they don't have money and to kind of chuck them out of their homes. But if you mean just buying property and using it as business and buying more, then I, I feel that that is permissible. Uh, right, so uh, reincarnation, I'd been asked... Yes, reincarnation. I I don't believe in reincarnation in that sense. If that's what reincarnation means to, to what it generally is understood as your soul kind of comes out and comes back to this world as another soul, but I feel that the ruh is connected. Um, right. So I feel that the ruh is connected. The arwah are connected, and because of that connection, maybe people this consciousness being collected, this social consciousness, maybe people feel as though they have been reincarnated. Um, so I feel that they, you know, it's the reincarnation theory from some perspective, if we're talking about arwah being connected and then ultimately connected to God, then the Quran also does mention things like that, but not quite in the way that like in Hinduism or Buddhism it's being mentioned. So... I would say that this is almost like the the story of the you know the blind men and the elephant and having to describe it and people have grasped a different uh, you know part and then describing it accordingly, right? So, um, so in that sense, the arwah they are connected. I feel and then ultimately they're connected to God. So I do feel in that sense one could think or experience maybe they. Because of this connection, they think they've been here before or they've had a past life. Or I don't believe that they have had a past life in this dunya. I believe that in this world, our lives are just limited, YOLO in this dunya, and then we move on. I do feel that what we will move on as will be more consciousness related. Um, but yeah, so I hope that makes some sense. Uh, what I meant, Mark Lonzetta, what I meant earlier on, should we as a principle have only public funding of elections compared to corporate bribery of politicians that exist today uh, to not bribe the judges? Yeah, I, I, I understand what you're saying, Mark, and that, that is a, 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 an interesting question. The, the issue will be, I think there should be some regulation. I think it's fair to say that people can kind of invest, but then you're right. I mean, people with more money then get to tip the elections because they've got more funding <laughs> but then at the same time if you control it then you're kind of not allowing people to exercise their liberties it's a really tough one really but i do agree that you know you get multi the, the multi-millionaire and, and billionaire corporations are going to fund people that support the elite and then they're going to get more funding and then they can advertise more and do stuff and and we've all watched that um you know, the Netflix kind of documentary on it, which was really scary, by the way. Um, 
somebody asked what my thoughts on Amir Muawiyah radiallahu an. I do I uh, see uh, Sayyidina Muawiyah radiallahu an as a great figure in Islam. I do highly respect him. I I understand that he they they had disagreements amongst the companions. I actually kind of like the uh, the statesmanship of Muawiyah. He was incredibly astute and really knew how you know some people are cut out to rule and I would feel that Muawiyah was one of those people that was cut out you know, he's cut from that cloth. Like he knew how to rule. And you can't deny that. I mean, in his 40 years of uh, rulership, he never within Sham had an uprising against him. Like that's just amazing, isn't it? <laughs> and I quoted the story once where he went past uh, this, he, he was going past this place and this lady was complaining. And she's saying, oh, and she used to be really pro Ali and anti Muawiyah. And he said that I've heard your crops or whatever. And she said she was complaining that she didn't have the crops and things like this. And he said, so you want me to, would you like me to assist you from the state fund to give you some? And she said, uh, yeah, okay. And he said, okay, I'll give you. And then he said to her, he said, you know, if I, if it was Ali, <laughs> he wouldn't give you. Because he would say, no, you know, there's a certain system and I'm not just going to give you and... And she says, uh, yeah, that's because he's more just. <laughs> so Muawiyah just laughs. You know, you got to love it, though. He kind of laughs and he says to the guy, he says, give her the crops. <laughs> and I just I just love that narration. Like the, the way, I don't know, it's, it's, it's amazing. Right, people, 